Welcome to Kirk Spano's Fundamental Trends for Friday, June 1st. I'm going to start off with a announcement. Next week, I'm going to do the webinar on Thursday night because I'm flying out of Milwaukee on Friday morning uh, to head out to Phoenix to visit my brother, sister-in-law, and their new baby. Not that new, about a year and a half. Might be two. I don't know. I don't know. I'm getting to be one of those old guys. I don't know. I was a little kid. And then uh, heading over to Las Vegas for two and a half weeks where I will be meeting people. So if you're coming out to Las Vegas in June, uh, the two Fridays that I will be meeting with people are Friday, June 15th and Friday, June 22nd. Um, and I will be doing webinars on both of those days as well. So if you want to come and listen in live on the 15th, I will be at the Flamingo Pool, I think, doing the webinar from there. And on the 22nd, um, I'll be staying near the Rio. So I don't know if I'm going to head out to a shop or if they have a clubhouse or, or what I'm going to be doing on the 22nd. But if you're going to be in Las Vegas from uh, June 14th, I'll actually be there on the 12th, but I have things going on. From the 14th to the 28th, I might be able to meet up with you, but the two main days are the 15th and the 22nd. And then um, uh, I don't know if I'll be doing a webinar on June 29th. I might push it off to the 30th because uh, I know that we're flying late. I think actually we'll stay on schedule on the 29th. I fly out of Las Vegas at about 8.30 at night on the 28th. So I should be in Milwaukee 2, 3 in the morning, take a nap, do the webinar. All right. So today um, we are going to talk about options. I uh, did an article today that um, got a lot more attention than I thought it would get. Uh, still trending on Seeking Alpha. So wrote printing money selling puts and wow, hundred. I did not think that this was going to get so much attention. I really just thought this was for the subscribers. I thought it would go largely unnoticed. And we have just a whole bunch of comments. Wow. Yeah. All right. A few people who uh, um, pure comedy. You don't mention the price of options in IV terms, in terms of value terms once. It's a beginner's article. What do you want me to do? Write a whole book? See, see some of these people. Yeah, I think it's the whole troll society that's been emerging with the internet uh, is, is just amazing to me. So those of you who follow me know that I don't suffer fools well. I don't. I'm not good at it. Uh, it is one of the uh, things that I should probably work on more. Uh, but I tend to give people, uh, give it back to people. Uh, I get bored, though, so sometimes I don't. All right, so I'm going to pull up the portfolio here real quick. Uh, and um, it's not really $798, but I started using their portfolio tracker and putting in one share, which I got uh, tired of real quick. All right, so um, take a look. This is what I own right now including these uh, ETFs down here. Um, I own more options than this and I've sold more options than this, but again, I don't, I don't shove them into um, Yahoo very often. It's not really a primary system, but it's easy to, easy to show you. So I'm just going to make life easier and delete all those. Delete those symbols. There you go. Yeah. There you go. So that's what I own. All right. Um, if you have questions about any of these, I've pretty much put them all in articles at one point or another. Uh, so I don't feel bad about showing you these. Although the trading that we do with these, the way that we build option strategies around them, uh, the entry and the exit points, 
the asset allocation, the weightings, uh, those are important. So uh, just having the names ain't gonna do it for you. All right, so printing money, selling puts. Uh, so one of the core strategies that we use here at Fundamental Trends is to uh, sell cash secured puts and, uh, and margin of safety investing. I have two investment letters. Um, and the reason I do it is because I learned how to trade options pretty early in my career. Uh, a gentleman who helped write the uh, test, part of the part of the series seven back in the 1970s on options, happened to be the guy that trained me. A great guy, uh, passed away now, uh, unfortunately. Um, and he was big into selling covered calls. Well, I soured on that pretty quickly because I was pretty good at picking out stocks early on and I didn't want my stocks to go up with me not owning them. Because if you write a covered call, you're essentially capping the gains that you can get on your stock. So the main thing to understand with selling cash secured puts is you're doing it to accumulate a position. It's nice to get the income and you will adjust your strike prices uh, based on whether you want the stock more or less, right? So in a case of uh, CenturyLink, if you were selling cash secured puts here, you could write your strike prices a little higher if you didn't own the stock already so that you know that it's probably gonna get put to you or you write the puts a little bit lower against your cash holdings that we're keeping for rainy days and uh, then just collect a little bit of premium lowering your overall cost basis. So selling a cash secured put, again, primarily to accumulate the position. Uh, the whole idea that you're just gonna rinse and repeat and over and over and over again sell options for your primary return is not the best strategy. You can do it. I know a lot of people out there like having a system, uh, but ultimately all the systems fail all the time. And what you really want is to uh, have a process for accumulating great holdings and generating some income and, and managing your risk. And if you do that well over a long period of time, you're gonna see the compounded returns in your portfolio, that extra 6% a year, 12% a year, or whatever it is you're generating income on your cash holdings, right? Which are, are normally idle and making almost nothing, um, maybe an extra percent or two right now, but in, in general, cash holdings don't make much money. Um, you wanna generate a return on your cash holdings. So one of the fallacies in the investment world is to be fully invested most of the time or almost all the time. It's the premise behind indexing. Um, it, it's why uh, financial planners jam me into all sorts of uh, investments and don't leave you with much cash. I don't take that approach. Uh, as you all know, I, uh, I do like to hold uh, quite a bit of cash. So I want a way to make money uh, on that cash. And uh, uh, this is not the updated version. It doesn't much matter. Uh, so, you know, when we, oh, this is the updated version. Okay. Uh, by the way, um, we, uh, uh, we have, I think, found a uh, spreadsheet solution. So, uh, you know, we've got a pretty good spreadsheet going here, um, but you know, Seeking Alpha doesn't provide a good tracking tool. So we're doing this on Google Sheets and, um, yeah, you know, and I changed the address so people can't steal it. But so when you take a look at our portfolio asset allocations, you have the punch card stocks, which um, you know we we are about twenty five percent large cap, fifteen percent mid and small, uh, international developed about ten, and international emerging about ten, and about twenty five percent cash equivalents, and that cash is what we're writing our puts against generally against our, our positions that we already own. So if I own CenturyLink, uh, but I'm willing to own a few percent more, I'll write a put against it, or I'll sell a put, not, not against the stock, but against my cash. And that will allow me to get a premium against my cash, right? And if the stock drops, I can buy the stock at a cheaper price. 
pretty simple concept. So as we go through the portfolios, um, the retirement dividend income is really just a dividend income portfolio that I don't use. Um, I use the punch card stocks and I use the retirement income options because if you're a retiree, you don't want to take as much risk as the stock market, but you still need a return because you're probably going to live to be 100. So uh, we, we do have 50% in cash if you're a retiree, but we're writing all sorts of puts against that cash generating a pretty fat income. So right now you can see some of the stocks we're in uh, and we want to sell puts uh, against the punch card stock and retirement dividend income portfolio stocks. And a lot of the dividend stocks, we actually won't write puts against because we just want to collect those dividends and we're getting them at cheap enough prices. So with the uh, stocks in here, we may or may not be selling puts on these, uh, but all these growth stocks, we're probably selling puts against. And growth stocks will generally have a much higher premium, uh, so you can collect a pretty good uh, uh, income on that. So again, going back to the CenturyLink case, which we've been accumulating um, since right about this price. I mean, I think most people are roughly even on their on their on their share price. But if you sold puts two or three times during this time frame, your real cost basis might be 15 or 16, which is, uh, you know, right there at, you know, real close to the, um, you know, five-year low. And five-year lows are important to follow. Uh, I don't think 10-year lows make much sense anymore uh, because that would take you back to the financial crisis. And as I've covered, because we've printed so much money, we're probably never going to see 700 on the S&P 500 again. There's just too much money in existence now. So we do think that the lower end of the S&P 500 is around 1,600-ish, um, which is the peak uh, that was resistance uh, prior to the two last crashes. So, you know, I, I just want to throw something out here. In a world where everybody's afraid of the next crash, right? Uh, you you do get a wall of worry to climb, and that wall of worry right now um, is pretty significant because we have what's going on in the Middle East, and we have um, you know quite quite a bit going on in the trade world. I, I'll tell you what, I just started a Twitter tag, um, fire Peter Navarro. I tell you what. Folks, you need to put pressure on President Trump because Peter Navarro might cause a trade war that causes stagflation and maybe even a depression. The rest of the world's getting pretty pissed off at us. And while I have talked about the United States' ability to flex its muscles, um, the approach that we're taking now is, is I mean, we're really standing close to the edge. So I, I have said that I think we should expect positive trade surprises, uh, but Peter Navarro worries me. Um, President Trump needs to understand that if the rest of the world decides to jam it to us, they can do it. Um, we need to at least keep our allies closer. What we're doing to Canada and Mexico is just uh, stupid. It's stupid. And NAFTA has been a great deal for America. Um, the people who run some of our corporations have screwed the Americans out of what, you know, what they should have gotten in return for that deal. Uh, but the aggregate wealth that has come to America because of NAFTA has been off the charts. The problem is a problem of distribution. So you don't kill the golden goose, you just spread the eggs around. So you know, that's, that's a different problem and that's a congressional issue because we keep voting for morons or, or bought and paid for people or whatever they are uh, that, that somehow believe that trickle-down economics works. And we are seeing year after year that it's becoming a bigger and bigger problem. And I'm not really sure <clears throat> at what point that comes to a head, um, but I'm afraid that uh, the snapback against capitalism uh, really could be uh, self-defeating and detrimental to all of our standards of living because capitalism, for all its flaws, is clearly the best 
um, economic policy, uh, economic approach. Uh, even China moves in that direction, even though they're socialist, communist, um, you know, at heart. So we need to be very careful uh, because otherwise these strategies, investment strategies won't matter uh, if the stock market collapses and we get a, get a depression or, or get stagflation. Now, when I say they won't matter, for the most, for most people it won't. For most people in funds and for most people who set it and forget it, for most people who think that broad diversification works, they're just going to take their 30, 40, 50% lump of sand, lump, lump, lump of coal again. And I don't want to minimize that because uh, it's going to be horrible. And, uh, you know, I don't think we should minimize that. But the attack on capitalism that could come, man, that would be even worse because then it would take something that should be a one or two year downturn and turn it into five or 10 or 15 or 20 years. And, and that would be the type of generational destruction uh, of, of wealth and standard of living that, it would be horrible. So we need to focus on fixing the problems of capitalism, which has to do with wealth distribution, has to do with the rules being tilted in the favor of the super wealthy, both on a regulatory front and on a tax front. And if we fix those, which really just takes tweaking, I'm a big, big believer in tweaking, not tearing down the system. Uh, I, I've run big organizations doing it that way. And it seems to work. You know, you, you can't destroy something to rebuild it unless you're an NBA franchise and even that usually fails. So anyway, that that's enough for that. Uh, we'll get into a little bit more into trade and oil at the end, but I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. So, so for these option trades, uh, some people have been asking me, where do I trade? And really your analysis of an option trade starts with the stock, right? You have to decide what do you think this stock is going to be worth in a few years? and how cheap do you think you can get it for, right? Because lowest cost basis wins. You want to have the lowest cost basis on stocks that you think are going to appreciate over time. In this case, CenturyLink pays the big fat dividend. I think they're gonna keep it. Um, I think they're just gonna grow into it, which means that I think this stock is going back into the 30s here in the next couple of years. <coughs> Excuse me, maybe not quite that quick, but so I, I bought an initial position in about 19, 18, 19. Uh, then I sold puts. <laughs> they got put to me. So I had a pretty good position. I got 4% of my money in CenturyLink. And ever since, I've been selling puts every few months, every two, three months on CenturyLink. The stock has chopped along sideways in this really nice consolidation pattern. And right now, the 50-day moving average is moving above the 200-day moving average, so up a so-called golden cross. And uh, that could really drive the price of CenturyLink up starting soon, presuming we don't have a market event. So collecting the dollar here, the dollar here, the dollar here, now all of a sudden we have a cost basis that's nice and low. And the higher volatility stocks are obviously the place to do this. Um, but when you deal with higher volatility stocks, you have to ask yourself, why is it higher volatility? What are my risks? And that is the same with any other stock decision or option position uh, decision is you start with what is the risk? Do I want to be in this in this company? And in my case, I have been, you know, talking about CenturyLink for a year now. Um, I want to be in this company. Uh, they're paying me to wait, right? They're paying me 10%, uh, 11% dividend to wait for them to write the ship. It's a down day, so probably a good day to sell puts. Um, and in the meantime, I've collected some cash. I'm up a few bucks, probably net. So three dollars. You know, maybe I'm 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 up fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen percent the past year, uh, which is not the sexiest thing in the world. But when you put the dividend on top, you know, and all of a sudden you're you're talking double digit returns, even though the stock hasn't moved. I think that's powerful. So Encana, which is uh, one of my favorite uh, oil holdings, uh, same same sort of story, is you got this golden cross here and the stock went up and then um, you know everything got beat up in February and the 50 day moving average came all the way back to the 200 day moving average and look at that, went back up. So now we got this trend upward. If you're a put seller, 
on this stock for the last year, you probably have a cost basis in the nines, would be my guess. Uh, that's where I'm at. My cost basis is about nine on the nose. Um, I actually uh, bought this stock a little early. Uh, so I actually have some shares that are down in the six, uh, six, seven, eight range. Um, I wasn't smart enough to buy it at 375 ish. I wish I had been smarter, but you know, I was waiting for it to break out. You got some confirmation back here again, and then it comes back. You know, what does this tell you? Oil is volatile. But if you've been selling puts for the last year, and even if you were selling a, put, a regular put seller for three years, right, for three years, you probably have a cost basis, again, under 10. The stock is up 1274, um, and, and you're ahead. And we haven't even seen a big breakout in oil stocks that I've been talking about, which I'm pretty sure is going to happen because the realized price of oil that these companies are getting now is going to be 10 to $20 higher than it was last year when they all became profitable and cash flow positive. So keep an eye on that. And um, for subscribers, I'm going to modify my position on, uh, on some of the uh, uh, offshore oil plays. I've been a big uh, advocate for uh, betting against in the past. I, I'm not right now, but you know, I bet against uh, rig, uh, you know, Transocean and Sea Drill a couple of years ago, and you know, just made gigantic, gigantic gains on those. Um, if you if you take a look on tip ranks, you can see that my bets on Sea Drill and Transocean did pretty good. Uh, let's see if I can find them. And I, I think this is a, okay, so here they are. So with rig, you know, we averaged 29% returns, sold it, went down, sold it, went down. We're going to get another chance to sell rig in a few years. And I hated the seed drill structure. To me, it just looked like this was going to be a company that was a sacrificial lamb for other parts of uh, uh, whatever his name is, the guy that runs the, the show, the rest of his empire. And sure enough went bankrupt. So we made huge gains on that. And, and this is just, you know, this is on leverage. We were using options. So our gains on on shorting C drill via puts by buying puts at that point was pretty big. But, uh, you know, just to get back to oil, um, we're starting to see some different things go on. And I have pointed out that the Gulf of Mexico is one of the sweet spots in offshore. So I'm going to I'm going to put out a couple picks that are going to benefit from the Gulf of Mexico because there, you know, there's a, there's a guy on seeking alpha, Johnny cage who uh, rips on me all the time telling me that the um, uh, shale drillers are crap. Well, some of the shale drillers are crap, but the ones in the Permian are pretty darn good. And as those pipelines get built over the next two years, they're going to start, you know, that spread from WTI, from Brent WTI to oil coming out of the Permian is going to dissipate. And as the spread contracts between Permian and WTI and the Canadian oil too, uh, as those spreads all contract, there's going to be major beneficiaries um, in the Canadian oil patch, uh, in the Permian, a handful in the Gulf, um, because WTI, the, the Brent spread is going to narrow dramatically. It, it's pretty, it's huge right now, like 15 bucks or something. Uh, actually, that's wrong. The, the, the spread from Permian is uh, like 15 bucks. Um, but still the spread from Brent to WTI is pretty big too. Um, and that will narrow over time and certain companies are going to do very well. So we just have to keep an eye on all of this. I don't hate all offshore. I hate most of the new deep water that they can't be developed profitably. See, but this in the Gulf, once they recoup their all-in cost, they're going to break even at about $30 a barrel. And I want you to understand how this works. So they put their, I don't know, I don't know how much they're spending on this. They put their $2 billion in. That first barrel of oil costs how much? $2 billion right? 
once they've made $2 billion, now their break even per barrel is 30 bucks. And that's what people don't understand is they think, well, it's break even at 30. Well, yeah, but not until they get their money back. And that's why a lot of deep water has been dying, why it's, uh, you're not seeing day rates go up is because there's just a huge still, even with uh, the dry docking and the decommissioning of rigs, there's still a huge um, surplus of rigs. So they can't even get good day rates. Um, Several of the companies are going to go bankrupt. I think there's two that survive in particular. I think Transocean survives, but I think they have to have a bankruptcy down, down the road. I think Ensco uh, is probably going to be pretty good. So, so we'll see how this all goes. But at some point, we're going to be able to short the, uh, the, the drillers again because deep water is just never going to pick up. It's never going to be efficient enough to beat this okay this is real you cannot believe that EVs are coming you're gonna be wrong they're coming how fast we don't know but fast enough that it impacts the decisions on drilling for oil in the deep water so if the commitment to a deep water project is billions of dollars even if the break e break even once they've recouped their money is going to be $30 a barrel, you still have to say, we got to recoup our money first. So if we're going to put 2 billion or 10 billion into a project, how long before we get our money back until we start making, you know, money on the $30 a barrel, right? So you got to pay off the bill first. And, um, you know, that that's actually been a big problem in the shale patch, which is why Wall Street and private equity and everybody else cracked down on giving them free money and why they're focusing on cash flow and um, profitability now. So again, trade policy, we need to be real careful about this. I, I can't implore you enough to put pressure on President Trump, uh, whether you're Democrat or Republican. Uh, I'll tell you what, I, I hang out with a lot of Republicans and they are very concerned that moving away from free trade um, is going to be a horrible, horrible outcome. And, and I agree with them. I've talked about that in the past. You don't want to think it can happen, but in the last week or two, uh, this stuff has really uh, shaken me a little bit. And, you know, I, I'm a guy who I don't think the next crisis is going to be American made, but I mean, we could be manufacturing one here. So let, let, let's, let's hope that doesn't happen. I know that there is a lot of populist and national thought out there. And I read this a while back, you know, there's a difference between populism and nationalism. Populism is because you want to put your people first uh, and that's fine. Um, but nationalism is basically because you hate other people and that's not fine. And we have to understand that we have to play nice with the rest of the world at some level, in particular, our allies. Again, I can't stress enough that us going after Europe and Canada and Mexico, you know, I don't think there's collusion between President Trump and the Russians beyond the fact that they're probably back channeling on Iran, but it makes you think that maybe they, there is something going on here because there's no way that we should be jamming it to our allies. Just there's no way, you know, we can ask them for things and then trade, you know, you know, we'll give you this, you do this for us, which is the way it's been. And by having those free trade agreements in place, again, this country has become spectacularly wealthy. The aggregate wealth generated in this country is off the charts. So again, I come back to, we have a distribution problem of the wealth. The rules are tilted in favor of the super wealthy, and then they buy more rules in their favor, whether it's tax or regulation. We have to fix that. You fix that at the congressional level. So vote for the people you think that will make sure that it's a level playing field for small fries like us. All right. So I'm done with my very rudimentary presentation. Um, I, I, with, with the selling puts, And you take a look at these. And in every case, every every stock has its own story. So with Calix or Calix, you know, they're they're helping Verizon and CenturyLink um, build out uh, their networks. 
And I think that at the end of the quarter, end of the year, probably Q4, they're going to blow out on um, earnings. I think they're going to have a great fourth quarter. So accumulating in this in this range, right? It's accumulating down in here. These are good prices. And I don't want people to focus on getting the lowest price. It's impossible to do that over and over. But if, if you have an idea of where the 200 day moving average is, where the 50 day moving average is, you can build your trades. So with this stock, um, it first got on my radar actually down in here and I had to learn about it. You know, I spent a couple of months reading up and trade magazines and, you know, started going up and I'm trying to understand why it's doing this. And we've gotten this nice period here of consolidation and doubt, right? People doubt it. So you have to buy when other people doubt. And, and, and you know, if, if you've made a determination, it's something you want to own. So right in, if you just keep selling puts in here, buy a little bit of a starter position and then sell puts every two, three months, you're going to generate some premium and you're going to accumulate a position. Now, this is the one <clears throat> where the put premium stunk. So we're not really getting paid here. And I want to talk about that. We're not getting a big premium here because in general, that means that the, the institutions and the people buying the shares don't look at this as super high risk. Right? They're not seeing the volatility. So there's not a huge short case to be made here. Put premiums go up when there's people who want to bet against it, right? You know, some people are insuring their positions, but other people are outright betting against. So some of the best stocks to sell puts on is that when you take a look at the most heavily shorted list and you find three or four or five of your companies on that list, First thing you should ask is, are the shorts right? You know, give them their due and, and analyze their argument. And then second, if you think that you're right and the shorts are wrong, you can, you can take a look at that short position as two things. One, it's going to generate good premiums for you. And two, it's rocket fuel for when the stocks turn around and start to rise. So what you'll see in chart after chart is I'm not trying to catch them here, right? That scares me. That's a cliff. But then this and then this, this choppiness here with a generally good trend, that I like, right? So this is a good accumulation period. Um, you see on the, on the money flow um, down here that it's a, it's a positive money flow. So people are accumulating. Somebody's buying. And, and that's that's a good sign. Uh, we can go right through, and I'm gonna move this over here so I can see it. Take a look at GameStop. And you see it's been choppy in here. Trend is against you. So you don't wanna be too aggressive because the trend is still against you. But if this blue line, this 50 days starts to turn, gets that bend in it, starts to bend up, which might be happening, then that's good. And as it closes in the 200 day, that's when you wanna say, okay, it's moving in my direction. And you have to keep an eye on the fundamentals, right? So the people who try to break this all down into 100% technical, I tell you what, they're guessing. Uh, you need to know something about the companies. You need to know a lot about the companies you're investing in. And people who are purely technical don't, and they'll tell you that they don't, and they're making short-term trades based on short-term movements. I don't want to do that because at some point, if I'm right and GameStop starts building a huge subscription base um, by transforming their business model uh, one more time, uh, then this stock's going to go straight up. And how do I know that? Because subscription revenue is amazing. Take a look at Netflix, right? So anything that you can get in on the ground floor as they start to build a subscription revenue model is, is going to be good for you. And I say this as somebody who sells subscriptions. People ask me, why don't you just manage money for rich people? And the reason I is, is one, then I have to deal with a whole bunch of demanding rich people. Uh, and, you know, and I'm getting to be pretty well off, but you know, a lot of people are very demanding and you know, I don't want the stress. I had a pimple this week, I man. Can you believe it? I'm 48 years old. I got a freaking pimple from stress. Um, and probably some greasy food, but 
you know, I, I want folks who are subscribing here to learn these basic techniques to, to help guide you through the markets. Um, and, and again, I'm not doing it by myself. I, I subscribe to just a boatload of stuff and that's not even the whole list. Um, and then I have everything through the brokerages and people I network with and talk to and journalists that I know and business people I know and see, you know, see level people I know. Um, I've had, I've had good mentorship. I, I've made some good connections. Um, it's funny. I've got a good Rolodex and nobody knows, you know, pe people around me don't know who I talk to. So it's interesting, but you take a look here at GameStop anyway. And I really like this, this area here, right? It's, it's, it seems like it's done going down chopping along chopping along is a good time to sell puts now they pay a huge dividend and if they do what I have suggested they do um, the dividends gonna stick and the reason would be is that they would sell off their technology division if they sell their technology division um, they don't have any you know big debt to speak of coming due they sell off their technology division now they can fund their transformation into a subscription-based business for uh, gaming downloads. And virtual reality is going to be um, at the heart of that. Oh, I hope that my charts didn't disappear. Oh, there they are. Um, go through the list, some other stocks. Oh, Claro is an interesting one. This is an arbitrage play. This is a company that was on our list. They're getting bought out by uh, Lumentum and the buyout price is supposed to be like $9.99. I think it's going to come down just a shade. Uh, but this is a stock where you sell puts on this. Um, it's, it's, it's almost free money, right? Because we're pretty sure it's going to get bought for above $9 in, due to the uh, merger. So these guys, uh, you know, again, our, our company uh, in technology and telecommunications, which uh, as a group is incredibly undervalued right now. So when you take a look at the sector comparisons, telecommunications just is beat to heck because people don't understand. They control the pipes. At some point, they're going to monetize those pipes. And, you know, that's, that's what's behind the AT&T decision to try to buy Time Warner. Um, take a look at Disney. Disney just showed up on my radar again because um, I think that they're going to be a substantial threat to uh, Netflix. Netflix, I think, is so incredibly highly valued. I think that they are risky. You know, people are jumping on and trying to, you know, make an extra 20% on that momentum trade. I don't think that's where I want to be. I want to find the stocks that are going to make money. So in the future, not in the past. You know, so Lumentum is a company that we're replacing in the very short list, you know, for uh, a, a Claro. Uh, and I'm not doing any trades on it yet. I don't know it inside and out. But I will tell you this. Mergers and acquisitions are usually good for the companies being acquired. Maybe not right away, though. So when this acquisition happens... Uh, and it finally goes through, I could see it getting back down in here into the 50 range, 50-ish range. I mean, look at that line right there. Boom, 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 breaks below it, gets back above it, comes back to it. So I think that this is pretty good support right in here, 50-ish. And, uh, you know, could it go down to the low 40s? Sure. And if it does, then I'll maybe even buy calls. But you know, this is a company that probably has a pretty bright future, so you should be reading up on them. Who else? SunPower. Again, I think that this might be a 10-bagger over the next decade, so I just want to keep selling puts and accumulating shares, and I think SunPower might be my biggest position a year from now, maybe two years from now. We'll see. Um, Sierra Wireless, another uh, Internet of Things play. And just look at that. Chop, 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 chop. Make all kinds of money selling puts on this one. You know, and accumulating the position. Uh, T2 Biosystems, they just got their FDA approval. Right, I'm not just oil, guys. You know, I, I, I look at, uh, you know, I believe that energy, healthcare, 
um, technology, and real estate are the four core places to be in the economy. And telecommunications and technology are now starting to merge. So you have to take a look at the telecommunications companies, which are out of favor, and I think are going to start making technology-like returns at some point. Um, and, and there's a case to be made for utilities if they crash low enough, because you got to remember the, go the government will protect them. So you just have to, that's a trade. Those are trades. I, I don't like owning utilities long-term, but uh, on big declines, like what was a year or two ago, I bought a few. Uh, Dominion, I like Dominion, uh, and there's a few others. All right, so again, here's a T2 biosystems, chop, 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 chop. Start going up on anticipation FDA. FDA announcement, stock drops. Why? Because like within hours of getting their uh, FDA approval, they announced a secondary offering. So look at this chop, 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 chop. And it's come all the way back to you. You ought to be buying a couple shares and selling puts on this. It's way up today. So, you know, we talked about this a couple days ago. So, you know, uh, T2, uh, with their tr with their uh, test for sepsis, uh, they can determine if you are got something that might kill you within a few hours versus the test that they're replacing, which took two to three days, right? You might be dead by then. So, you know, everybody's, almost everybody's gonna, with, with any type of symptoms and get tested for sepsis in a hospital. So, you know, this could be a massive moneymaker about a year and a half to two years out. So you accumulate your position now, why? Because you don't know and I don't know when the market's gonna decide that it's in love. We don't know, right? So even though the earnings might not come for a year and a half or two years, at some point the market's gonna say, hey, look at that, this one's gonna be great, and then people bid it up. So you do have to get in front uh, of the line. All right, XOP, a little bit of oil. You know, we were accumulating a ton of it down in here. And then get some more here. And then when it comes back towards 40, you know, that's a, you know, on these dips, it's a great places to, to sell puts on XOP. Jeffrey Gunluck, you know, at the Stone Investor Conference uh, and a couple other big time investors have met, mentioned XOP. It's just great. It's a great fund. You know, you take a look at these holdings again, I tell you, a lot of these are great companies. Um, We've been talking about a new company that I might add to the uh, short list. Um, here's Andiver. You know, we were buying this when it was still to Sorrel. Uh, three, four hundred percent maybe made on that, the people who got in a couple of years ago. So selling puts with, with the because you want to accumulate a position, right? That's how you have to think of it. Not just, hey, I'm generating a premium. It's generating a premium to lower your cost basis on something that you own and are trying to own more of. All right. All right, let's take a look at the questions. Let's see if we can get out of here in exactly an hour today. Yes, I love Paul Simon too. I've seen him in concert a couple times at Summerfest. Summerfest starts in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin in about three weeks, the world's biggest music festival. If you're looking for somewhere to shoot to, I, I tell you, you have a hard time beating it. And and Sweeney, the guy who runs it, used to be the president of Florida Marlins. Man, has he got a pretty good eye for finding uh, up-and-coming music. You know, some of those bands um, he finds before they're super popular, Imagine Dragons, Evanescence. I mean, some of these bands that he brought in, holy cow. So that's my plug, Summerfest, Milwaukee. Come on down. All right, good morning from Connecticut. Yes, is it time to buy USO or USOU calls? Um so, <clears throat> I mentioned, you know, down around here is where you really back up the truck. So, you know, we're, we're pretty close to where we bought in, right? You know, we're only down a couple bucks, and that's really because of what's going on today. Um, so, I don't think there's really anything to do, right? Now, if it drops down in here... Yeah, then you then you add right because it's hitting a pretty big support line. I will tell you about the lowest that oil can go is about sixty-two bucks a share. 
So if you start seeing prices in the low 60s, that's when you back up the truck. All right. Um, in general, now the reason why I will use a three-time leveraged on USO or on oil is because it's trading in backwardation, which is good for the rolling, right? For the futures rolling that underlie this contract, underlying this ETF. And because I believe that's general trend for oil is higher. This fall off here is temporary. And the traders wants you to believe that, oh my God, oil's gonna fall off a cliff. Look, here's why it's not. These guys are starting their oil project in the Gulf of Mexico early because they know that we have a supply problem occurring. There's been so little investment in deep water because they're afraid of not making their money back um, that we are kind of creating a balanced market. We're creating that peak oil plateau that I've talked about in article after article after article. So we have to deal with, and, and these guys are talking about this about the same time out, and there's a difference between depletion and decline, but we have to deal with those problems. Depletion has to do with running out of oil, which we're not, but there is less cheap oil. Right, the decline rates are the existing wells and, 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 and their production. And why are decline rates pretty important? It's because technology has been flattening out the decline rates uh, a little bit in certain places, but with shale oil, we know that the decline rates are high. And after two, three years, they have to refract or close or you know just accept that there's not much oil. So the decline rates are important. The global decline rate annually is about 5%. So at almost 100 million barrels a day produced now um, and demanded, uh, we have to replace 5 million barrels a day with new discoveries and new drilling. What do we know? We know that new oil discoveries are at their lowest level ever last year. Combination of two things. One, we found most of it already. Two, we're not doing as much exploration. Why aren't we doing as much exploration? Again, Everybody knows that EVs are coming that cares to know. So that's why we, 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 we care about this. So even though there's more oil coming online in the shale, you gotta remember three-year-old shale wells aren't producing much, right? So they have to keep doing more to offset the declines. The offshore rigs are starting to decline even more. Although, like I said, there's been a stall with technology but that won't hold forever. Eventually the oil, there's less oil. Um, and demand still is going up for at least the next, you know, how long do we think oil is gonna keep going up on the demand? Well, according to this guy. Oil demand probably rises through about 2030 mid 20s 20s for sure then you have this kind of flattish period peak oil plateau and the plateau isn't just the flattish period but it's the fact that supply and demand will remain basically tied at the hip so that the price can remain on a plateau the price of oil is going to hover around 80 bucks a barrel short of shocks right so recessions Wars, recessions can drive it down a bit, wars can drive it up. Um, and then eventually if electric vehicles really start being the leader, I'm projecting that second half of the 2020s, and then oil falls off a cliff. At that point, the supply of oil will exceed demand and that'll keep the price down so that they can keep selling, you know, and this will mainly be the Middle East and mainly be Saudi Arabia, Iran, Iraq, selling this oil, um, OPEC. So during the great decline phase for oil, it'll be the cheapest oil that survives. Makes sense, right? So there'll be some offshore that's still out there because those legacy wells last a long time. They can pump oil 20, 30 years, 40 years, I bet. Um, but in the short run, uh, oil is going to tr drift upwards. Yeah, you know, like I said, with levered ETFs like QQQ, a TQQQ. You just have to be careful, right? I mean, it's been it's been a great thing to be on for years, right? But look here, 
You don't want to be in leveraged ETFs when this is happening. So I would say stay away from them. Um, there's different option strategies you can use with QQQ and SPY and the diamond uh, that we're going to talk about uh, for members because in the next year or two, we for sure want to increase our hedging. And I'm afraid we have to start hedging now um, just because I'm afraid of what's going on with the trade. All right, so let's see here. Just just mind the risk. Always mind the risk. Talked about the Brent WTI crude before I saw the question. Um, I think we're going to find out there's a health problem. CEO, yeah. Over there. Um, American Cancer Society changing the... Uh, Recommended age for testing for colon cancer to 45 from 50. How does that impact exact science as well? You remember, I mentioned that in an article a year to, a year ago. Um, we knew it was coming. People who, you know, studied it knew it was coming. Uh, it's not going to impact sales for another year or two, um, maybe three. Uh, but eventually it's going to make a big deal in sales. So, you know, they could end up, you know, having another million sales a year. Uh, I think that exact is for sure going to 100 uh, in the next couple of years. Uh, I think it can still go to 200, but something in their pipeline has to be positive. They need another product, and they're having a hard time. So, you know, I don't think uh, exact is the, the baby that it was a couple of years ago when it was five, six, seven, eight dollars I mean, now that it's 60 oh, did I just do that? I whiffed. Okay. Take a look at exact sciences. Now, I was a raging bull on exact sciences, right? Uh, so I was loading up on stock. All these years I was buying exact sciences. Had it for 10 years now. Selling puts all along the way, sell put, sell put, sell put. Why? Because I was getting a ton of premium and I knew that stock was going in the right direction. Sell put, sell put, sell puts, get it put to me, get it put to me, get it put to me. My cost basis on exact sciences is below zero um, when you figure in the uh, premiums. I bought a whole bunch of calls in here because I knew CMS and FDA would be favorable, made a ton of money. So it became a 10 bagger for me. And I took most of my profits. Um, and then I started buying back right about here. Yeah, that was a mistake. <laughs> it dropped down here. So I started buying my position back in here, got crushed, got some people mad at me. But I knew that the company would be fine. I knew that the USPSTF thing wasn't going to be a big deal. Um, so I started buying calls again. And, you know, that ended up being a home run. I told most people to sell between 60 and 62. And now we're back up near to 60, you know, we're back to 60 today. Um, I don't think this is a company that you should be having a gigantic position in anymore. Do you want a couple percent in your portfolio? Yes. Uh, I think it probably does make it to 100, but it needs positive pipeline development, at least one, to make that $200, uh, you know, high end of the range uh, achievable. So, you know, good stock. A lot, lot of a uh, lot of downside though. If they fail on their, uh, if their sales end up being lackluster, I mean, this stock could for sure, for sure go back to 35. I don't think that it will, but that's the risk. So if your downside is 25 bucks and your upside is only 40, it's not exactly the three to one ratio that you want. You want your upside to be at least triple what your downside is. Um, you know, and you know, when you exclude for anything can go to zero, but you know, this is uh, something to keep an eye on. U.S. Yeah, yeah, oil still in backwardation. Uh, that that doesn't change overnight. Yeah, I I know what the White House is doing with the um with the tariffs, and and that's why I don't think that this all goes haywire, um, but. But enough people are getting pissed off that it could be a problem. Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah, exactly right. What President Trump is doing is unprecedented and it could go wrong. That's just the way it is. Um, I, I think it all works out. Um, I, I, I still think the tax bill and the Fed and the Fed uh, tightening are both going to cause a recession eventually. And then these other things could complicate it. So I hope that's not true. I hope the, hope the tax code gets fixed in the early 2020s. I hope that, you know, because the middle class deserves a tax break, but, you know, lowering the top income tax rate on people in, in, the, in the top 1%, that didn't make any sense at all. And it's the main driver of the deficit spending. They got to get rid of that. So they have to repeal that part of it. Um, and, and Democrats will be the only ones that will do that. So in any case, yeah, I, I worry that the trade issues, you know, could be a problem. And as we've seen, and I told everybody in the Goldilocks article three months ago or whenever it was, oil can cause a recession. But like I told you there too, I, I expect the Saudi Arabia won't let that happen. They have the spare capacity to put us on that 80-ish dollar price and, and to keep us there, right? Supply shock, Saudi pumps oil. In fact, Russia, because Russia will do this sort of thing, um, uh, need the front page here. Here, there you go, there you go. Head, headline, bam. And this is me. This is most of their spare capacity. So why did uh, Russia decide to start pumping in seventy thousand more barrels per day? Because that's probably about all they had, and they want to make sure it gets to market. They don't have all kinds of more spare production capacity. You know, it says here one hundred twenty thousand, one hundred fifty thousand more barrels per day, maybe for a little while. But those oil fields are in bad shape out there. They have not done a good job, and now that Exxon's not helping them. You, you, Russia's basically at capacity. All right. Taxes on put. So you mainly want to sell your puts in IRAs if you can, but if you have money sitting in cash in a taxable account, ask yourself a question. Do you want to pay income tax on making money or pay no income tax because you didn't make any money? Pretty easy answer, right? Uh, no, I did not say healthcare should be one of the sectors to be in. I think, I think there's a massive bear market in health in healthcare is coming. So I pay attention to healthcare because over the long run, it's been a good section, a uh, good place to be. But since the Affordable Care Act, a lot of those stocks have gone through the roof because they got to keep gaming the system. There really was nothing negative for them and the system was made bigger. The healthcare system has to be made smaller in, in, in total dollar size. Um, and the healthcare companies are gonna get the crap beat out of them. I think the health insurance companies are gonna get crushed, crushed. Yeah, if you own United Healthcare or any of these healthcare companies, you're playing with fire, you're being greedy, you've made the money, take it. Um, and at some point we're gonna short uh, United Healthcare. We did the one little swing trade on it. And we made some money, 20, 30, 40%, whatever it was, you know, on, on a 2% position. So maybe drop the 80 basis points to the bottom line. Um, but uh, yeah, a lot of those companies are going to heck. The companies that are going to do well in healthcare are going to be some of the companies that can help the government reduce healthcare spending. Diagnostics companies are probably the sweet spot. Uh, I've been following Zach's. No, Zach's. Zach's is a trend following system. By the time you get the information, it's over with. So what you want to do is what I just started doing. I, you know, I used to program algorithms a long time ago and stuff that I use doesn't even exist really anymore. But, uh, it was, that was 12 years ago. Uh, so I enrolled in a bunch of, uh, uh, yeah, what, what's it called? Udemy, Udemy. So I am gonna add some algorithms to our trading, my courses. There you go. Python for financial analysis and algorithmic trading. Mm, we got some good stuff coming. 
and I'm learning more about blockchain. I'll be hanging out with a couple of blockchain engineers in August. Hopefully I bump into a couple in Vegas. Um, but, uh, you know, did I buy six? Wow. Oh. I got a lot of reading to do this summer, but um, yeah. So uh, yeah, with trend trading, you basically have to do it yourself. If you're if you're using a service um, that's not like like with my service, um, we're taking longer term trend trades, but uh, the short term stuff you gotta do day of. Permian bottlenecks. Um, I actually have an article. Uh, that I have to finish writing in the next week. Drafts. As you can see, I start a lot of articles so that I can record my ideas. Permian piping and profits. So we're gonna talk about the pipelines that are getting built in the Permian. And uh, there are some stocks that I'm gonna mention in the next week that we should probably add to the list and see if we can find uh, good prices. Thursday night webinar, um, yes, I will post a link. Probably seven o'clock or eight o'clock central. Probably eight o'clock central so folks on the West Coast can have their dinner before they, or maybe they can eat dinner while, while we're doing it. But um, probably eight o'clock next week, should we commit to eight o'clock? Let's commit to eight o'clock. Yes, yeah, yeah. So Permian, uh, there's a big spread on Permian right now, right? Permian crude, but the comp certain companies have it, certain companies don't, right? You have to take look, take a look at the companies that already have takeaway deals. There's all kinds of companies with takeaway deals that work for them and they get a higher price. We happen to be in a couple of those companies, right? So that 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 goes into the equation when I pick out these companies is do they have good takeaway? So you can't just buy them willy-nilly. You gotta check to see, okay, what's their takeaway? What's their really, what is their actual realized prices? All right, we're at an hour. Let's call it a call it a weekend. Um, I will send out a blog tomorrow with this link. It'll be on the YouTube page uh, tomorrow morning. And um, then on Sunday, I'll write a little bit more Sunday night and get the macro Monday and uh, for the Macro Monday piece, does anybody have any thoughts on what they really want to hear about? Uh, I've got three or four things that I could write about. You know, trade, I'm getting tired of talking to people about oil. Um, we can start talking about the next financial crisis. I know everybody else is way ahead of me on that. All things smart. Should we talk about the smart everything world? Okay. The smart everything world it is. All right, have a great weekend, everybody.